never say never. That's one of the things I've learned after so many years of collecting. There are countless albums that are just too expensive. They're too rare. You never run across them. Figured I'd highlight a few of those bucket list albums I never thought I'd own in this episode of Talking About Records. My name is G.I. Sanders from NTX Vinyl, a small chain of independent record shops in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. If you're not local but you are in the U.S., you can shop online at ntxvinyl.com and we'd love it if you'd subscribe to our channel here on YouTube, follow us across social media on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at ntxvinyl is the handle. All right, let's talk about bucket list albums or grails or whatever you want to call them. These are albums that, um, for the most part, I never thought I'd own legitimately because they're just out of my price range. I don't really like spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars on a single album. In fact, I've rarely done it. Um, but not only cost, I think rarity is a thing as well. You know, whether it's super value valuable, it might just be an album that I've just never run across, whether it be in record stores, whether it be buying collections for NTX Final, whatever it may be. Um, I pick these out because I have seldom seen them. And in fact, I can probably go through each of these and this copy that I'm going to show you is the only time I've ever seen this record, ever held this record. Um, and that's, uh, again, maybe that maybe it's because they're super valuable, but maybe it's also just because part of the country I'm in, uh, the type of music I typically look for, the stores I go to, whatever maybe I've just never run across these albums. And so um, it was fun to kind of go through my Discogs list as well as my wall and in my room and just see what uh, what stood out to me. Um, so I picked out 10. We're going to start off with uh, actually the most recent one I've uh, come across, and this is The Winding Sheet, the debut solo record by Mark Lanigan, most uh, famously known for being the lead singer of The Screaming Trees. Um, I love Mark. I love his voice. Unfortunately, we lost him just a couple years ago. Um, but this is a fantastic debut um, from, in my opinion, one of the most underrated songwriters and performers from the uh, you know late '80s, early '90s scene. Uh, certainly overshadowed by the the likes of you know Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, all those bands who went on to much bigger success mainstream wise. But Screaming Trees and uh, Mark Lanigan and his solo work are just fantastic. This features members of Nirvana and Dinosaur Jr. right on the uh, sticker there. Uh, this came out in 89 on Sub Pop um, at a time when, uh, you know, Screaming Trees was, you know, they were a few years into their career already by 89. So were bands like Soundgarden, you know, Nirvana was just starting out with Bleach. Um, but, you know, one of the pioneers of the Seattle sound, if you will, and in my opinion, just a uh, such a unique voice um, I, I would equate it to kind of the grunge era's version of like a Tom Waits or a Bob Dylan or something, just a really unique voice that, um, it's kind of an acquired taste and a lot of people don't like Lanigan's voice because of how raspy and how raw it is. Um, but this is a great record. Um, I love Undertow. I love Down in the Dark, Eyes of a Child. The title track is great. This also features a cover of Where Did You Sleep Last Night, which is like a traditional song most famously known, uh, at least from this era, from Nirvana covering it on Unplugged, but uh, uh, Mark gives his take on it. So this is one that i just never seen. I got this in a, like I mentioned recently, in a collection um, from a good guy who, uh, him and his wife were moving, and they came to me with a collection they needed to downsize in order to fund their move. And uh, this was one of the couple hundred records that he pieced out of his collection, and uh, one of those that I ended up keeping out of it, which happens every so often. So super, super excited to have this in the collection. Not one I'd ever thought I'd find, never seen it before. Um, I've looked at it online, of course, but typically goes for, uh, you know, out of my price range. And typically you just don't see it in the United States either. A lot of this, a lot of the late eighties, early nineties kind of sub pop era 
stuff you just don't see a lot a lot of those bands were more popular overseas and this is uh this is one example of a mark lanigan lp that is just the case all right next up changing gears let's talk about this 1957 copy of roundabout midnight by miles davis this is a, a beautiful pressing it's kind of a funny story um this is the six eye columbia logo which is the one you want right I, uh, I've been ramping up my jazz collecting um, over the last several years, honestly. And of course, Miles Davis is a staple. He has so many albums. This is one of those albums that I've been holding out on. I, um, I didn't buy a reissue of it. You know, again, I've, I've probably got now 20 different Miles records in my collection. But that, the, that it's taken several years to accumulate. And this is one where I was like... You know, I'm going to hold out. Maybe I'll run across it someday. I don't know. And then this is going back just a couple months. Um, and I finally broke down because Mobile Fidelity uh, reissued the MoFi version. And I was like, oh, that's great. I can get the MoFi version of Roundabout Midnight and finally hear this record. Um, I, I honestly have probably never even heard it. I don't rarely, rarely stream jazz. Um, it's pretty much a vinyl experience for me, which I love. Um, and so I hadn't really heard this one, but it's a very famous record. One of his, I would say probably top five records as far as like, um, you know, how iconic they are, the covers, the names, and, and again, just being around music, I know the, the album cover and the name and that type of thing. So I got the mobile fidelity and before the mobile fidelity arrived, you know, it was shipping, took a week or two or whatever. And, uh, and then I ended up buying a huge collection, which I featured the collection in a video, just probably about a month or so ago, uh, if you go back in the channel based on the date. Um, and this was in there. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Like, I finally end up pulling the trigger and buy a new reissue. It's a mobile fidelity reissue. So, uh, you know, it sounds fantastic. But then I come across the six eye and I was just like, oh, it's so, so funny how that happens. But this is a great record. I mean, like most Miles records, or I'm sorry, like most of the Miles records that, that I love, uh, very chill vibe. You just imagine it in a dark club in New York um, is where I kind of always take uh, take it to. And this is uh, this is no different. This is Coltrane along with Miles, with Paul Chambers on bass and uh, Philly Joe Jones on drums and Red Garland on piano. Just a beautiful record, as you would imagine, uh, based on the cover art, based on the title. Very chill very laid back, um, super sultry and silky. And just what, just what I love about miles. Um, I'm not a huge fan of miles's later work as you get into the more free jazz and experimental periods. I appreciate it. And I think it's super cool how his career and his evolution, uh, went as an artist. Um, but for me, late 50s early 60s miles that's where it's at and this is one of those i just never thought i'd find a six eye after not even owning the album itself for so long and stumbled across it so i was super excited about that one all right next on the list queens of the stone age this is the self-titled debut record um this is a 2010 reissue actually and that tells you how rare this album is to find an original um, originally came out, um, I don't even have the 98, I think it came out originally. I'd have to double check that, but this was another interesting, similar to the Miles one. So I didn't own this record. I own, I think everything in Queens catalog. I had a, like a, uh, an unofficial bootleg version of this one because that was all that was there, but it didn't really sound that great. And, um, then they announced the reissue campaign where they were reissuing not only the self-titled record, um, but also, uh, like clockwork and villains. And I was excited about that because I'm like, great, I'm finally going to get a, a, an official pressing of the first record. Um, and then kind of similar before that even came out, because that was like kind of a pre-order now. It's been a few months. Months ago, I, I picked this up in a small collection. I was like, I couldn't believe it. I like I didn't didn't have it. I was going to wait and just get the reissue, which I kept one of those as well. But uh, but this is, a um, again, a, a pretty sought after record as far as Queens is concerned. There's a couple different versions of it artwork wise there. You can see what the, uh, the middle looks like. Um, and you've got the, got the trio on the back, pretty underrated record. Regular John is a standout as the, uh, the, the track that kicks it off. Mexicola, um, walking on the sidewalks, give the mule what he wants. Some pretty cool tracks on this. And it goes back. Like if you, if you followed, um, 
you know, masters, masters of reality, and you follow, followed into Caius and Fu Manchu, and then uh, Queens. Like this is one of those early, early stoner desert kind of stoner rock albums that, for me, um, you know, it sets the stage for what's to come with Queens. Because after this, you get into Rated R and Songs for the Deaf, and I think that's when Josh Homme really came into his own from a songwriting perspective. But I still love the heaviness of these, of uh, this early record, and uh, super excited to have uh, again an official pressing of that one. So, all right. Let's go way further back. How about some uh, some garage, post hardcore punk, whatever you want to call them? It's the Stooges. They're one of a kind, right? This record sent me on uh, quite a spiral because Stooges are one of those bands. First of all, kind of like I was saying about Miles Davis, I don't think I've ever streamed the Stooges. Um, just like I don't stream a lot of jazz albums like this. They just sound better to me on vinyl, and I feel like they deserve to be listened to on vinyl, if that's weird, because it gets my full attention. And um, I've always known the Stooges, I've known Iggy Pop, I've kind of known some of the bigger hits. But in the last couple of years, the more I've got into collecting and expanding what I listen to, the Stooges are one of those bands that I've really dove into. I own you know, their discography now, which is not that big. But this is an original pressing. I'm not seeing the year on it, but uh, someone will correct me on the year this came out for sure, because um, it's not even listed here. But this is an original um, Electro label, which is really, really nice. Um, it sounds fantastic. I don't know if this is my favorite Stooges record. Um, it probably is. I, I, I do. I mean, 1969, I Want to Be Your Dog, No Fun, Real Call Time. Um, it's just such a great album and so unique. And uh, it's just unfortunate how short-lived the band was. You know, now, this many years later, really getting into them. And, you know, I watched a, a couple documentaries on the story and kind of how it all went down. And it was just... Uh, such an explosive time in the uh, the late 60s, early 70s, when all this was happening uh, with the Stooges in Detroit and the Ramones in New York and all of that going on. But uh, I came across this. Um, this was in a bigger collection. I remember um, the funny one, actually, my son was with me, my 12-year-old son, Ben, and a good buddy of mine, um, Al, who used to uh, go on digs with me. And this is this is in the middle of covid um, and we ended up, uh, hitting, I guess it was kind of like a garage, but it was temper temperature controlled. And I've told this story before, but I showed up to this uh, gentleman's house and I was mainly dealing with the wife and she said, Oh, um, let me go get him. And he came out and he walks me out into kind of his storage facility that he had on his property or whatever. And he had had probably uh, two or three walls that looked like the one behind me. And so I basically said like, oh, you know, are you, are you downsizing or what are you, are you looking to get rid of the whole thing? Or can we just look through certain uh, albums and pick out the ones we want? Like I was kind of getting the lay of the land, which is very typical. And he looked at me and he said, I don't know. I didn't even know I was selling this stuff. I didn't even know you were coming. My wife just told me 30 minutes ago. And I was like, oh my gosh, are you serious? Like I felt horrible. Like he had all these records collected his whole life. Long story short. Talked to him some more. He was an older fella and didn't uh, wasn't in the best health, put it that way. And so he followed that up with, "But I know that I need to get rid of some of this stuff because if I, if anything, if and when something happens to me, my wife's not going to know what to do with any of it. So I'm better off passing it on to someone who will appreciate it." So I was like, "Oh, thank God!" So he got it, even though he was caught by surprise. Long story short, this is the type of collection that that was. Uh, this was one of those in there. Um, and there was a ton of early punk, a ton of early like Texas country stuff. Um, there was, it was every genre across the board. Um, and there was even some metal stuff. It got into the mid eighties ish. Um, but most of it was sixties and seventies. So glad I found this one. Glad I held on to it. Um, and it's really turned me on to the Stooges, which is a beautiful thing. So, all right. Um, this is one, Apple by the greatness of Mother Love Bone. Um, this actually, I think I purchased from an individual seller. I did chase this one down, and I would say definitely a bucket list album for me. This is one of the uh, one of the pinnacle albums from the Pacific Northwest scene. 
um, that kind of started it all. Obviously, the genesis of Pearl Jam uh, is, is rooted here. Um, and in a lot of ways, you know, obviously Temple of the Dog came out of this when Andy Wood passed away and so much of the inspiration for Chris Cornell and everything he did with Soundgarden. So a uh, hugely important album. Um, I put this one on here mainly because it was out of my price range. Like it had gotten to a point where I was like, I don't think I'm ever going to own a, a, an official original copy. I, I had a bootleg copy, uh, similar to what I was saying about, um, about Queens of the Stone Age, but, um, um, somebody came to me, had this one along with a couple other rarities, um, and had them at good prices and cut me a deal. And I was like, man, I'll definitely do that. Um, I don't remember what I paid for it, but it wasn't anything crazy. And I've been watching, been watching it online for years, but it just continues to climb. And it's just such a rare one. This is, uh, on the Polydor label. If you're not familiar with this, um, Stargazer, um, Crown of Thorns is, is a big one. Um, I just love I love going through this Stardog Champion, Holy Roller, um, such a great record and so iconic, you know, Andy Wood, Greg Gilmore, Bruce Fairweather, Stone and Jeff, produced by the great Terry Date, uh, mastered by Bob Ludwig, um, you know, came out in 1990, was the only full length release um, and unfortunately he passed away right around that time and, uh, and Jeff and Stone went and actually did a little promotion for this album but by and large it was it was it was dead in the water you know because of what happened so very tragic very short-lived but uh appreciate the records and still listen to them often so all right next up this one was given to me which is always a fantastic thing when someone gifts you an album this is fantastic planet live by failure i'm pretty sure i featured this in my autographed albums because obviously you can see it is autographed this is one i didn't think i would own again simply because the price had gotten out of control. Pretty much everything failures put out on um, vinyl is pretty pretty hard to come by. There are some reissues that have started to surface. But uh, if you're not familiar, Failure is a band from um, the early 90s. They were on, I believe, the first Lollapalooza tour and were poised to be a huge band. But it's pri they primarily stayed underground. They're just not a mainstream, radio-friendly type of band. So even back in the 90s when Alternative and... Um, you know, that type of thing was the mainstream, um, uh, failure still wasn't getting, getting a bunch of airplay. The one, the one song off fantastic planet that I think got a little bit of love and had a video like on MTV was, um, was stuck on you. This is, um, this is a full, um, yeah, stuck on you. Sorry, I was looking for it, making sure I got the name right. This is the full, uh, the full album, Fantastic Planet, which is a very rare record to find in its own. Performed live in 2017, and it's on a really cool translucent blue and translucent red vinyl gatefold. Um, a good buddy of mine knows I love the band and uh, was working with the band at a certain point in time and had an extra copy of this one. So that's how I ended up getting gifted such a beautiful record. If you're not familiar with Failure, um, Fantastic Planet is the album to start with. This live version is great as well. Um, but again, it was just one of those where I love the I love the record. I was like, do I really need a live version? And again, the cost it got so much, was not expecting to ever get an autographed copy, much less a, a normal copy on its own. But I love this album and cherish it. And I'm really thankful for my buddy who gave it to me. All right, next up. This is an interesting one um, you may not have heard of. This is the Clarence Greenwood recordings by Citizen Cope. As you can see, it is signed as well. This is actually a numbered copy. I got number 87 out of 1,000. This is definitely one I never thought I would own. If you're not familiar with Citizen Cope, he's a, a really great singer-songwriter, has a pretty, pretty deep discography and still very active to this day, touring, writing music. Um, it's got a, uh, there's a soul. There's definitely some soul in his voice. Uh, but it's mainly guitar based drum driven. Um, there's there's kind of a, a folksy element in some ways. Um, and I think that's just a tribute to his, his songwriting talent. Um, but the original copies of this, I don't know when it originally came out. I'd have to double check. I want to say it was early 2000s or so, which is like the dark days of vinyl. Uh, the original copies of this album in particular, which is by and large, you know, um, most people consider it to be his best myself included. And, um, they were crazy. Like it was $500 plus 
if you could even find a copy, which I don't think, I, I mean, I rarely saw a copy available on Discogs or eBay because I would frequently check and have alerts set up and all that. You just never saw it available. So it's kind of written it off. Then finally, Citizen Cope and uh, you know his team announced that they got the rights back to press it, but they only got the rights to press a thousand copies. Something in great. I think I could probably get one of these because I don't know if there's a thousand people who will jump on top of this right away. Eventually, I know a thousand will probably sell out because he is, again, an established artist. But he announced it and unfortunately announced it with this crazy pre-order campaign where he was selling the numbered copies. Like if you wanted a lower number, you had you you could pay like several hundreds of dollars. I think the the I think copies one through ten were like a thousand dollars each or something. It was a terrible campaign in regards to how this record was launched and his fan base flamed him for it and rightfully so. And when I say him, I don't know if it was him, but whoever's managing his business uh, could be him. He could be that hands on. I don't know. Um, so they launched this pre-order campaign and everyone went crazy and was like, you're nuts. Why are you charging so much for this record? People just want the music. Um, in the end, he actually pulled it down even though some people like myself pre-ordered it. So I didn't pre-order one of the crazy early copy or crazy low number copies or anything. I did pay good money, but I was like, this is an album I'll maybe never own otherwise. Cause it sounded like he got the rights to press these 1000 and that's probably it. So once these are gone, the originals are far gone. You're never going to be able to copy. So I bit the bullet and I splurged on this one and got a copy. Um, and long story short, there was a delay in the pressing. Um, apparently, at the pressing plant, they stamped this as a Vinyl Me Please pressing, which is the record club. It had nothing to do with that, but they stamped it on the jacket. So they had to scratch it, and redo it, and there was these delays. So he ended up, so anyone who pre-ordered, I think, the original version or the, during the original launch got an autographed copy. So that's why mine signed. Uh, originally, you know, I, don't, I don't know if everyone's in the, who ordered 1,000 or signed or not, but... It's a fantastic record. I absolutely love it. Uh, Pablo Picasso, Sun's Gonna Rise, Sideways is a standout, Hurricane Waters, Bullet in a Target. It's a beautiful record. If you don't know this, go stream it. Highly recommend Citizen Cope. All right, a couple more left on the bucket list. Yet another one that I thought this is never going to happen because it's just so far gone. This is Neil Young's Unplugged. I'm pretty sure I featured this. I did, an, I did a video quite a while back of albums that I'd love to own on vinyl that I didn't yet. And I think I featured 10 albums. And I want to say I've got maybe half of those now. And this is one of those. Uh, this is one I want to say I grabbed it off eBay. I think, uh, you know, I chased this one down. I've never seen it in the wild, never seen it at a record store, never seen it in a collection. Um, it's never been released in the U.S., um, which is part of the issue. It's only been released in Europe. But if you're a fan of Neil and specifically the era of him during, um, you know, like Harvest Moon era, which is early 90s, Ragged Glory, Sleeps with Angels, all that vibe of Neil. This is a great, great set. Um, he's got some classic songs on this as well, like Helpless, um, Unknown Legend is from, and from Hank to Hendrix. Those are from, uh, from Harvest Moon. Uh, Long May You Run from his compilation, with, from, from his album with Stills. Um, early stuff like Mr. Soul and The Old Laughing Lady. A beautiful set. There's a great story behind it. He actually recorded his Unplugged twice. Neil's very particular. The first show he didn't like it all and they scrapped it and they came back the next day and recorded it. And so love this one. It's a very gentle recording and one of my favorite MTV Unplugs and there's a lot of good ones. So uh, if you have a chance, grab this one, but it's, it's really hard to, really hard to find. Speaking of really hard to find, we've only got a couple left. Yet another album that I've never seen, I have never held, and never thought I'd own because it is crazy expensive. This is The Greatness of Midnight Vultures by Beck, who is one of my favorite artists, uh, most well-known for his first couple records, um, Mellow Gold, as well as Odile. Then he went on to do... Um, Midnight Vultures, which is kind of like, I guess, his Prince record, the way I kind of describe it, because it's really left field. 
um, even for, for Beck. And he, he does a lot of different stuff. You know, he's got acoustic based albums. He's got more kind of rock based albums. This is, uh, this is a standout. It's really unique in his catalog. It features, um, a ton of tracks. I don't even need to pull the record out. Um, you've got peaches and cream, you've got Deborah, you've got sex laws, so many great songs it and this album dropped at a time in my life where i was really uh i was really into it so i just remember listening to this album nonstop. i think it came out early early 2000 um let's see uh 99 actually so but yeah i walked into um a guy's house uh, who's actually a friend now who was looking to downsize and he had absorbed a collection from someone who passed away he used to work at a record store and he had a ton of albums from the, well, he had a ton of albums from all eras, but a lot specifically from that period of like kind of the late 90s, early 2000s, when production of vinyl essentially stopped. Like there were still albums being pressed, but it was so far and few between. And this is, you know, pre like big time e-commerce internet buying, especially for records. Um, and so if, if you didn't walk into your local store and see it, you, it basically didn't exist. Cause at least myself, I didn't do a lot of mail order stuff back then. Um, cause you just didn't trust it. Right. Um, so I walked in my buddy's house and I remember walking in and he had a, you know, wall of, of records that I was going to start looking through and probably, you know, purchase a whole bunch from him. kind of not the whole collection, but he was like, yeah, look through and see what you want. And I saw the spine of this record and I was kind of talking to him just like I'm talking to you. And I'm looking to my right because the wall is over here and I see the spine of this record. It's very, you can, it stands out. It's this bright green with uh, kind of pink and yellow. And like even peripherally, I can see this record. And they were in alphabetic order. So there's A's and B's right there. And I could see the spine and we're kind of chatting and I kind of, we, were, we wound up our conversation and I go, can I look right there? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, I just went right over to, I pulled it out. I said, do you know what this is? And he's like, no, I've never seen that record before. So I told him, I was like, this is one of my biggest bucket list items. I can't believe you own it. Are you willing to sell it? And he's like, yeah, everything. I need to downsize all of this. And so I didn't get it like super cheap. Um, uh, he gave me a good deal on it because he's a good guy. But uh, but just so happy to own it. It, is a, it was sealed when I bought it. Um, and so I've opened it up and uh, spun it many, many times. And very appreciative that he uh, he let me take a crack at it. Love this record. Check it out. Last but not least on the bucket list, there's only been one album that I've ever done a video on on this channel where it was a, a single video about a single album. And that was when I acquired Inema by Tool. This is uh, the soundtrack to my high school and years, 1996. I was a massive Tool fan, still am, but at this time, coming from Undertow into Inema, um, was just uh, a period where the band was all over radio, all over MTV. So there was mainstream as they got, even though it, it, for an alternative metal band. But this is one that has just eluded me, and I had completely written it off. I've ha I have a really nice uh, bootleg copy of this that I've had for probably 10 years, and I was content with that. And then I was talking with a friend, um, and he uh, he told me he had this, and he was like, if you want it, you know, it doesn't mean that much to me. He knew I was a huge fan. This was also a sealed copy that I have since opened and played because that's what I do with my records. I play them. Um, and I traded him actually a whole stack of records, um, some rare stuff, some just tons. It, it, it was, I got a great deal. Don't get me wrong. He was very nice to, to uh, make me a deal on this record, but he knew how much it meant to me. Um, it's, it's got a little, it's got a little wear. It's got a promo notch in it. It's got a corner ding. Um, but again, it was sealed. So it's a, it's a beautiful album as far as the LP itself. I actually took the hype stickers off because the shrink was completely coming off and, uh, and affixed them to my outer sleeve, but I'm just so happy to have it. I still can't even believe I'm holding it in my hands. This is uh, there's only like three different pressings of this album that official pressings. Um, and, uh, and just, you know, they go for thousands, you know, like if you find one, if you can find one, that's the problem is just finding one first and then uh, having the confidence to make an offer on it. He also gave me this, uh, he had this sticker, which was a promotional sticker that I think he got at the same time that you can see October 1st, 1996. Really, really cool. So yeah, definitely one of those bucket list albums that I never thought I'd own. I still kept my bootleg, which I love because I've owned it for 10 years. And so I'll spend that one every now and then as well. But I love dropping the needle on this original copy because um, it takes me back to 96. Seeing the band, I saw them uh, 
think I saw them four times on the Anima tour. They came through Dallas um, twice, I believe. Or no, I saw them once in Dallas. I saw them in San Antonio. I saw them in Austin, the Austin Music Hall. Uh, San Antonio, like I mentioned, which was actually Live Oak, um, just outside San Antonio, and then saw them on Lollapalooza, uh, 96 or 97, um, along with like Snoop Dogg, and I think Prodigy was on that tour. Um, it was a it was a fantastic day. Tool in broad daylight. Maynard came out in clown makeup with a bra on, <laughs> and like big old stiletto heels. It was uh, it was quite a sight to see so there you go there's some bucket list albums that i am very glad that i have checked off let me know uh let me know some bucket list albums on your on your list i would love to know what people are after and what are those ones that you're kind of that you've kind of written off but like i said never say never stay the course be patient keep digging keep hunting you never know what you'll come across thanks as always for watching my name is gi sanders and we'll see you again next time on another episode of talking about it.